Okay, good morning everybody. <coughs> uh, let's continue our discussion uh, of constructors and static data members and functions uh, of chapter 7. <coughs> Yesterday we we are introduced with uh, static data members static data members such as this one and static functions such as this one we said that we said that static data members are shared by all the members of a class <coughs> all the objects of uh, uh, of the class and uh, uh, if one of the objects changes the static data member all the others see the effect that's for that's good for uh, tracking that means uh, if you like to know how many objects i have created in a constructor you would increment this count uh, uh, static data member and since you are incrementing the same thing all the objects see the effects okay so these are static data members and static functions are very similar static functions are the functions that work on on that can work only on the Static data members. Static functions cannot work on uh, 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 non-static data members uh, uh, for the same reason. Static functions cannot call non-static uh, member functions. Okay. In a way that we we I kept saying this last time. Okay. Static data members are like globals. Okay. And static function members are like global functions. Okay. Maybe I should uh, I should maybe give more okay what is going on okay now like global variables and similarly static data <clears throat> static function members are like global functions you might say that okay we didn't like the globals in object oriented programming languages yeah but they are not exactly globals they cannot be accessed from anywhere okay especially the st static data members to be able to access them you need the class name okay it is not a exact global and if you like to hide them you can hide them in your private and nobody is going to access them and static functions again they work like globals because I don't need an object to make a static function call. Okay, I don't need an object to call a uh, make a, a static function call. That's how we use. For example, in, we don't do this in C plus plus, but in Java there are no global functions. But how are you gonna call the function square root? S Q R T. Okay square root how are you gonna call this function if there are no global functions so the solution was uh, under the math let's say it's a math class okay there is a square root function and i would call this so this is not a global function it belongs to a class and i call that function from that class and uh, it is not a global function anymore okay good so we talked about uh, statics and we, we talked about why they are useful, the, the difference between the non-static data members and non-static uh, function members. And after that, we said that how, how do how we, we talked about how we implement this idea of static data members and static functions in C++. This was how it was done. So this is static integer here. These are non-static uh, uh, regular uh, uh, data members and uh, important thing to remember here is the how we initialize these static uh, data members it is initialized like a global is initialized okay it's very similar it is initialized like a global is initialized 
and <clears throat> and uh, and and um, we use it. We use it uh, using uh, the static function that uh, we have provided as a public uh, function, public static function. The interesting thing here, the interesting th thing here is, I, uh, I. I can call the static functions using the class name only. Okay. Uh, that was that was we never did such a thing before because to be able to call a function we needed an object, and with the object only I can call the function. But those were non-static functions. Now we have the static functions I can call them, and it is okay to have to make a call uh, of static member functions using the object names like this. This is okay, but usually we don't prefer this and way your because microphone is off. this is not, this is not. Oh, somebody turned off. Somebody turned off my microphone. <clears throat> uh, so the, this is not the way we prefer to, we prefer calling uh, static member functions because uh, I cannot see difference between this call and the uh, non-static call. I mean, for the compiler, it doesn't matter either that way or that way. Of course, this is not possible because there is no object yet, but these two are possible. But we don't prefer it this way. We prefer this way, okay? So if it's a static, use the class name to call the function, okay? So we talked all about this, and uh, if there are uh, questions, I can... I can answer them, so I kind of repeated what we did last time for maybe five, six minutes. Any questions about the static data members? Did they teach you about the static local variables in C? Did they teach you about static local variables in a function? Yes. They, yes, they did. Okay. So we nobody likes that kind of static. Okay, because it is it is it had some problems. So in C plus plus we don't use those statics at all, and and there, there are many meanings of static, and some of them are discontinued and deprecated, and we are not supporting it. They say. But this use of static that I am teaching you uh, is a common thing between object-oriented programming languages. Java has the same structure as as, 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 uh, as C++. Okay, if there are no questions, then, uh, uh, and we talked about this program from the book. Okay. Uh, so, uh, let me move on to a new topic, nested and local classes. In C++ and in many object-oriented programming languages, you may have nested and local classes. Here is a class definition. Okay. Here is another class definition. A class inside another class. This may happen. Okay. So this class named nested is inside this class outside. And it may have regular functions, regular data members, or static data members, static functions, doesn't matter. Whatever you can have with a regular class, you can have the same thing with the nested class. Okay? So this is how you initialize a this is how you initialize a nested class static. Inside this class, there is another class, and inside that, there is a static data member, and I initialize to five. Okay, and this is how you implement this function f of the class nested. Inside the outside class, there is a nested class, and that nested class has a function f that returns an integer, and I am implementing it to be a very simple function that returns zero. Okay, and if you like, this is if, if if it is too too long for you to type all the time. If you like, you may have a type def. You would say that uh, my nested class name will be out nest, and now I can do this. 
Okay. So this is a uh, nested class. Why do we have nested classes? Okay. Uh, it is the same reason why we have encapsulation. Okay. You might say that I have a special class, but that special class is only will be used by this outside class and it will not be useful anywhere else. So it makes sense to make this class part of the outside class because nobody is going to use it. I am not going to let anybody else independently use this nested class. It's a special class. Okay, so the same idea as encapsulation or the information hiding. I hid my information that is not required by outside world inside my class. That information doesn't have to be regular data members such as the strings or day of years and etc. Okay, so remember we had a similar thing. I mean, this is this is an example of a composition. This is an example of a composition, and we did the composition before using holiday class and the day of year class if you remember okay this is similar but we are saying that this nested class is not useful outside of this outside class our day of year was very useful class i mean i could have used it without uh, the holiday class that's why i made them two separate classes so uh, maybe we will not see examples of this we will not see examples of this uh, 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 many times in the book, but in real life it is done. And when you say this uh, done in a different place, don't get surprised. And I think in your homework, I think in your third homework, I ask you to, I ask you to do uh, this nested class. I am not sure. Did I separate it in a separate class or same class? I don't remember. Okay, so uh, nested classes are local and sometimes they are called local classes uh, are possible and do, the book talks about this. So read that section too. And I gave you an example here. Okay. So if there are no questions, then, then I will move on with vectors. Okay, I guess there are no questions. Then I will move. Uh, vectors are... <clears throat> uh, uh, remember, we keep talking about <clears throat> a new class should be following the object-oriented programming rules. It should hide all the details from the user of the class, and it should provide all the necessary functions to manipulate uh, all the class related stuff yeah these are nice stuff nice things but in C when we talk about arrays when we talk about arrays remember how you learned about arrays they teach you uh, how to create arrays yeah how to use arrays yeah but they immediately tell you when you send an array to a function it is actually a pointer you need to send the size of it and arrays are stored in the memory, okay, like like this, and this is the beginning address, okay, this is a pointer, and you need to specify the size and etc. So they need to teach you lots of details about how the arrays are implemented in C, okay? Exactly opposite of what we try to achieve with the object-oriented programming languages, okay? So we don't like in C++, the regular C arrays, we don't like them, okay? Because they are not adding any information. They are not very easily usable. And you need to know lots of details about the array usage. And sometimes you need to know about the pointers, okay? You need to iterate one by one. You need to know about the increment operator, decrement operator, pointer comparison, and etc. right? And when it comes to dynamic arrays, it is more difficult. Like you have to remember all those dynamic allocation, deallocation kind of stuff. So C++ says that, okay, I will give you a new class named vector. That vector is going to be like an array. 
and I will follow all the rules of object-oriented uh, programming. I will hide all the details. The user of my class won't uh, will not be will not be will not be required to know the details of how the arrays are uh, uh, dynamically uh, enlarged uh, uh, and the, their sizes are decreased or increased. Okay, and indexing is going to be uh, fine. Assignment is going to be fine. When you pass uh, vectors, you don't have to worry about the size and etc. Okay, so that's the idea. <coughs> okay, vectors are like arrays, but they are object-oriented arrays. Okay, as the users of vectors, we don't have to worry about how the underlying mechanism of the vectors work. We don't care. We just use them. So this is how you use it. Actually, this is how you use it. You would say, you would say, I have a vector of integers, and let's call this v. I did not specify any size at the beginning. Okay, I did not specify uh, uh, any sizes at the beginning. So what am I gonna do with this one? Well, this, there is nothing. There is not much things that you can do. Maybe I could just do this. Just print out size of this vector. Okay, I would expect this would print. Okay, this would print zero, right? Because there is nothing in it. So let's put some things in it. Let's say uh, since the size is zero, I cannot put anything directly to it. Maybe I can do this. I can do v dot push back 10. So this appends an integer of 10, an integer of value 10 at the end of this array. Since there is uh, zero elements in it, it will be the only element. And I push back one value. So the content of the array will be 10. I am not going to draw the memory now because I don't know how this vector keeps the array in it. Okay, I, I, I'm not going to draw it. Well, actually I know, but because since I read the documentation, I am not going to think about it because that, that's not there's no use for me. That's not going to be useful for me. Okay, so that's, that's nice, that's good. And maybe I can do this for in a loop i from 0 to 5 let's increment i by 1 and let's do this push back thing push back and i times 10 so every time i push back one value i push back one value the size of the array will be incremented automatically and i don't have to think about what's going on with the memory what's going on with the dynamic allocation the allocation etc Okay, so if I if I run the same if I run the same um, code again here, if I can do it, I don't know where it was going on. Okay, here here it is. Okay, now if I if I run the same code, this time it's going to produce it's going to produce what? It's going to produce. Tell me what is going to produce. Twenty. What? 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 what huh? Where, where do you guys get the 20? I don't understand. What is 20? Whoa, okay. It is 6. Why is it 20? 100? Size is the size of the array. So, okay, okay, okay. I, I got it now. Okay. You think that pushback is increasing the size of the array. No, it is not increasing the size of the array. Pushback is just, it just adds one element to the array so let me maybe even though the memory is not like this let me try to show you how the memory might look like okay at the beginning when i say v it is empty when i do the pushback 10 its size is one and the first element is 10 
And when I do this loop in the first iteration, I'm going to push back uh, zero times 10 is going to be zero. Then in the second iteration, it is 10. Then third iteration, 20, 30, and 40, okay? So at the end of this loop, this array will have this, the, these, these values and v, v dot size is going to print six, okay? So maybe I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, maybe I was not that clear when I talk about this pushback. Pushback puts one element at the end of the uh, at the end of the array, okay? So I thought I I think you thought that pushback is increasing the size of the array by that much. That's why. Okay, so you thought ten is increasing here, and then each time maybe hundred is coming from the anyway. Okay, I don't know what you thought, but maybe it's my mistake. So pushback is just pushes back one element at the end of the array. Pop back just does the opposite. When you do the pop back, okay. Let me do okay. V. Okay. V dot pop back just does the opposite. When you do pop back, it just takes this one out. Now my array, my vector is going to have a size of five now. Okay, pop back just the opposite. The nice thing about this is, as I said before, I don't have to worry about allocation, reallocation, okay? Uh, thinking about the memory where it ends with the sizes. When it comes to when it comes to sending my vectors to functions such as let's say I have a function f1, uh, this is what I do. Just send the vector in it. Okay. Let's implement this function. Let's say void f. I don't know what it does, but okay. Let's take it as a constant because we that a constant vector int address of let's say my parameter input vector and in a for loop this is what i'm gonna do um in a for loop um int i v okay see out remember this is a range for loop see out I, sorry, IV, C out I. Okay, so this is as simple as this. So I did not send the size. I just send the, uh, it looks like the function name is F1. Okay, I just send the, uh, the vector as a constant reference parameter. This one takes it and it this one it trace over all the members of the all the members of the uh, array one by one and it prints them out. It prints them out. Okay, so I didn't send the size. I did not have to. Maybe let's let, maybe let, let me write. Maybe it would be more helpful to write this. Okay. Um, Move it here. Okay. So I am going to write it the old way integer i from zero to i is less than my uh, my input vector dot size and increment the value of i and of course i should say here here i should say i i v i okay so i guess this is clearer why well, didn't have to send the size of the vector because size is already contained. There are many useful function members of array uh, vector, okay? So, and the, the, the nice thing is that I, uh, this is an integer vector. I could have vectors of, I could have vectors of 
vectors of strings no problem I can have vectors of day of year objects no problem even I can have vectors of vectors of integer okay this is a this is like a two-dimensional vector okay each element of this vector okay let me call this v2 okay each element of this vector is another vector so when you do v2 1 it gives you a vector and I could do this indexing on it okay so this is very powerful this is good and uh, uh, three-dimensional four-dimensional five-dimensional vectors are this way possible uh, one thing people uh, have some trouble with this kind of vector usage is that here you should put a you should put you should leave let me make it a little bit more a little bit more distant there should be definitely a space between these two okay otherwise it would become a right shift operator and the compiler would get confused compiler would say that what are you doing with the right shift operator here right don't put them right after other they put a put a space between them okay so good so these are the these are the vectors and uh, uh, from now on since i introduce introduce vectors to you okay you may use vectors in your homeworks but if i told you use arrays then you're going to use arrays arrays are different than vectors uh, i said that we don't like arrays in c plus and etc yeah but we don't want to use them but in in many of our homeworks i will ask you to implement some stuff using arrays because we are trying to learn something right for example when when the time comes we will learn how to implement this vector class okay when you learn how to implement this vector class we are going to use arrays under it okay arrays in it so as a C C++ programmer of course you need to know about the arrays arrays are important but as a C++ uh, programmer in the real life okay most of the time you will use vectors or some similar stuff okay vectors are from standard template library standard template library or we call it STL okay we call this STL okay we call this STL and there are many classes like vectors in STL uh, such as queues and stacks and digs and etc and you will you, you will see some of them at the end of this semester okay I guess I have a question how can we initialize the whole vector like we do with the arrays it is like it is like arrays you would put uh, there is this equal thing and the curly bracket and you could do the similar stuff like the arrays in fact let me show you the documentation I mean of the vectors this is a documentation from c++.com I asked them to give me the array stuff okay this this part let's not worry about this yet it will come later maybe okay so these are some of the data members um and um, we will not talk about the uh, data members let's look at this c plus plus 11 editions okay so nice thing about the uh, one of the nice things about the uh, vectors is assignment operator uh, assignment operator works assignment operator works okay uh, here let's say i have a second i have a I have a second I 
I have a second. Uh, a, a, a vector v2 after I did all of this I could just say v2 gets the value of v no problem I, of course I cannot do the same thing with the arrays right and this assignment is a proper assignment everything is all the allocations and everything is done correctly okay so assignment operator works iterators we will talk about it since in C, we use lots of pointer arithmetic, okay? But with the vectors, these are not valid anymore. Instead, we have the iterators. And these are some capacity-related stuff. Size, we already use it, okay? This capacity is interesting, okay? Return the size of allocated storage capacity. When you make a new array, when you make a new vector like this, I know that the sizes of these two are zero. Sizes are zero, but the allocated number of elements for these vectors are not zero. It is greater than zero. Okay, so the vector is smart enough to allocate more space. When you do a pushback, it keeps using that space. If that space is not uh, large enough, then it does a new reallocation. Okay, uh, resize is a uh, 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 method uh, is a function that changes the size of the array. You, you may say that my array is going to have a size of uh, 100. By the way, with the constructors, with the constructors, this is possible. Let me do this. Okay. With the constructors, you could say that I have an array of 100. So your array sizes are now 100. This is possible. There are many options of the uh, constructors and I didn't get the constructors. To access the elements, you could use the index operator, okay, like the array. Or you could use the add function. Add function and index function are very similar. Add function and index function are very similar. Let me try to say this, okay. Okay. Um, these two lines would produce exactly the same thing i v dot add function i these two lines produce exactly the same thing okay they would produce exactly the same thing and in fact let me put them under uh, same block okay so what is the difference the difference is this if i is greater than size or less than zero okay this would print out some garbage value on, on your screen if i is greater than size or less than zero this would produce a runtime error it says that you are reaching out of index out of range index okay this index is not valid if the index is not valid so add is smarter than the index operator by the way i made a mistake here it, it should not be why nobody is correcting me this should be a function call this should be a function call okay at i Okay, good. So let's go back to the uh, functions again. At uh, like front and back are the ones that access the last element, the first element, etc. There are many details I am not uh, talking about. Okay, we talked about pushback and popback. There is insert and erase and swap I said oh okay I accidentally touched one of them okay there are again there are many other stuff that we that we are not going to get into maybe when we discuss this uh, when we discuss this uh, STL STL library okay the standard template library 
we will we will talk about the vectors vectors have many siblings vectors here okay there is this list class there is d class q class set class stack class i guess you i guess you can i guess you you may have some good guesses uh, of what they are how they are used we have a question can we insert an element at the beginning of the vector yeah using the using the insert using the insert where is my insert yeah using the insert function you could insert elements at any place that you like and allocation the allocation moving of the elements they are all done automatically for you and there is there is push front and pop front functions available for some of the classes but not for vectors okay but using the insert you could do that but as you may have guessed it is expensive i mean making an insert is expensive okay and insert doesn't insert uh, just single element you could and you could insert works in a way that okay okay there are many overloads of insert you could insert a simple single element or you could insert you could insert many many elements at the same time uh, you could insert another vector inside the vector and they, these are all done automatically you say no matter of course yeah that's possible it's like arrays that's what i said right it's like arrays uh, yeah, the Hussein number says that can we can we behave array the vector elements like the array elements yes of course you could index operator works exactly the same as array operators okay can we say vector and stack similar to each other well you are gonna see the the, the differences between vector and stack when we take this uh, data structures course data structures and algorithms course and you will see that there are similarities but usually we see that there are many many uh, differences between these two data structures they are very different uh, arrays are supposed uh, vectors are supposed to be behave like arrays stacks are very specialized arrays they behave differently okay let's let's go back to our slides okay similar to array has a base type okay and stores collection of base type values and this is the base type we have never seen anything like this before actually i mean we we had a class named string yes but we did not uh, uh, and string is part of the standard library yes but we did not see any type like uh, angled bracket uh, uh that includes angled brackets and the base type and etc okay and we are, we are going to see more and more of these later an example like i did before an integer vector okay it's indexed like arrays for access using the index operator and there is a member function pushback there is a member function size and here is an example that uh, comes directly from the book there is an integer vector and i ask my user to enter a number of positive now a number of positive integers at the end give me a negative number so that i can know how the when the loop ends and in a while loop if the next is the the value that i get from the keyboard uh, uh, when the value is greater than zero i will quit this loop and every time i i push back next okay so every time the user enters a non-negative integer i add it at the end of the array and each time the array size increases okay each time the array size increases and i print that size on my screen and i keep getting this and then what and then after the user enters the last integer okay uh, i i i uh, run this uh, loop i iterate over this loop and i print out the results i print out the contents okay this is a sample run the user enters two four six eight and minus one and that means that i am going to keep um four values in it the size of the array will be four and i do this okay so 
uh, how many f how many day, uh, member functions did I use? I use size, I use pushback, and I use this operator, index operator, three of them. Okay. Good. Uh, question here. Um, if I do this, V5 guess the value of 17. Tell me what happens. You see, in five happens. What do you mean five? <laughs> that that's a funny answer. Five, five happens. Alakan says allocation error. Muhammad says if allocated memory, it works. Well, I mean, uh, uh, Muhammad, uh, as you see, I did not allocate anything. I said that my array is empty. So with this case, it's going to I don't know. The result is uh, uh, I don't know okay i don't know what's going to happen probably it will cause a, a segmentation fault it will say that i am trying to access some memory location that doesn't belong to me but most probably it's going to write to some place in memory that i am not supposed to write okay so uh, either way it's a bad thing okay this is a bad thing you might say that, so what happened to object orientedness? I mean, whenever we do something, it is supposed to be right. If it is not right, the, the compile is going to happen, etc. So what happened to it? So if you are concerned about this out of index accesses, okay, if you are worried about this out of index accesses, don't do this then. Do this. Just do this. V v dot at parentheses five guess the value of 17. when you do this okay since five is greater than zero your program will be stopped and you will get a runtime error that will say that you did something bad okay this is a bad thing too but at least you are getting an error from your code okay so if you are not sure if you are over your index okay the final index then use this uh, other function at so question why don't we use at all the time or why didn't they implement this index in a way that it works like at if it is out of index then it give, it would give me an error message why didn't they implement this index operator on the vectors like at works? Anybody? If if the way it works is is nice, if I like it, it is the more object oriented behavior. It gives me nice error messages when I make a mistake, so it is the class is easy to use. Yeah. Anonymous says that the index operator works more simple and faster. Maybe yeah, exactly. And uh, at at is more inefficient. Why? Because every time it works. It has to do the range checking. It is it less than zero? It is greater than the size, and etc. That's that's that would be too efficient, too inefficient for some of my applications. Okay, so uh, uh, they they made this decision. They say that okay, index operators 
okay they they are they are good efficient but they have this short this shortcoming and be 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 be, be aware of this and use index operator at your own risk and this is possible and you are saying that okay i'm taking that risk usually we don't like these kind of solutions in theoretical world in theoretical world okay uh, i don't like these kind of compromises but in practical engineering life, you have to do this kind of decisions all the time. Okay, you cannot live by the rules all the time for the sake of efficiency, for the sake of your needs. Sometimes you need to make compromises. The important thing is that you know what you are compromising. Okay, know the bad effects, the risks and uh, behave accordingly. Good. Okay, we will make these kind of decisions all the time. Right? Do you see? I said that we don't like global functions in object-oriented programming languages, but the first thing that we are writing is a main function, which is a global, right? So why didn't they eliminate this main function then in C++? I mean, if they have eliminated it, then they, they would lose the they would lose the backwards comp compatibility with C, and that would have been bad, okay? That would have been bad. So they made this compromise, and they are saying that main. So why are we calling this global function exit or the global function what what do we call global function sine or cosine or square root well i mean there is this nice template standard library of c and we need them what are, what are we going to do we are going to rewrite them again so we are not going to do that we are going to call those functions okay so uh, as i said we are going to make these kind of decisions all the time so a vector efficiency it, is, it could it could behave it is as efficient as arrays okay it could be as efficient as, as arrays sometimes you might think that you might think that okay you might think that every time i do this pushback so how do you do the pushback if this is my array if this is my vector if this is my vector okay v it is one at the uh, beginning okay so when i when i when i do the pushback i need to add one element to the end but let's say there is another let's say there is another data structure here let's say it's a i cannot i cannot push back that value here so what am i gonna do i will some allocate some new space and i will copy this value here one and i will push back my new value let's say 10 here and i will get rid of this one so another pushback i may have to do this over and over again so it is inefficient it is inefficient so how would i eliminate this inefficiency every time i do a pushback maybe you could do this at the beginning instead of saying v just give me 10 positions but in that case the size would be 10 i don't like this i don't want my size to be set to 10 at the beginning so what am i gonna do the book says that okay book says that use this function reserve okay reserve reserves in this case 32 integers but your size is still zero so when you say vector integer v is size is zero when you say uh, v dot reserve 100 its size is still zero c out v dot size this one will print okay zero size is zero but you know that there are 100 integers reserved in your vector so every time you make a pushback it is very efficient you just use uh, some reserved position okay this continues until you hit the size of 100 when you come to size of 100 okay uh, uh, when you do the pushback uh, the, the 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 code automatically allocates name space okay if you like to know your reserved size use this function capacity capacity is different than size capacity says that although your size is zero you have a 
reservation of 100 integers in your vector okay and it is typically greater than size okay it is definitely equal to or greater than size okay so uh, as i said there are ways of using these vectors efficiently they are as efficient as the arrays okay but they are much more flexible to use than uh, arrays why because assignment is possible um, call by value call by reference of these vectors are possible the comparisons are possible actually did i show you the comparisons where is where is my oh okay i think there is go back one yeah relational operators see the relational operators such as not equal to greater than okay less than etc they are all possible with the uh, arrays what is the meaning of greater than or less than and etc you just read the uh, you just read the uh, 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 documentation here is an example it says that i have two integer vectors uh, one of them size um, 100 means that initialize this vector with the value of hundreds all the time okay so you, it has three elements and each of them will be 100 this one has two elements each of them uh, will have the value of 200 okay so i could ask these questions are they equal are they one of the less than the other one etc the meaning of less than or greater than uh, is is documented in these in these in these pages okay so i although the book doesn't talk about the vectors a lot i prefer talking about the vector because vector is a very nice sample class for us okay if you are writing new classes write classes like the vector okay your new classes should behave like vector how well it hides all the details of how it works okay so information hiding is there abstraction is there i don't know how my values are represented in the memory i don't know okay it is all abstracted away from me and everything is encapsulated the data is hidden from me and i can use the interface which is documented nicely to do whatever i want it is efficient both efficient and object oriented okay object oriented so uh, string the class string and class vector are two example classes that i will talk about all the time and uh, when i when i wanted to give good examples of classes nice design designed classes we will talk about these classes uh, all the time okay it looks like i am out of time for the first part of this lecture let's take 10 minutes of break then we will continue so let's be here around 9 35 
Okay, so uh, these are the vectors and we have seen this example of uh, vector usage and we talked about the efficiency and that, that completes the discussion about this chapter, chapter number seven and if there are no questions then I will start talking about uh, a new concept, operator overloading. Are there any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, then I will... Okay, so the name of the chapter is Operator Overloading Friends and References. Uh, sounds like a, a very friendly chapter, just friends, nice friend means nice things, but in object-oriented world, we don't like friends at all, okay? Some of the object-oriented programming languages, they completely avoid friends, they say that no friends, etc. Uh, and some of the object-oriented programming languages, they don't do operator overloading. But in C++, we have operator overloading and friends. In fact, the operator overloading is not part of the classical object-oriented programming languages, but C++ says that if you're going to write reusable classes, then operating overloading has to be there because it makes things a lot nicer. And we are going to look at it. Yeah. So the with the operator overloading is like function overloading actually. Uh, we like this a lot, right? We like
Okay. We like this a lot. Integer i7, j2, and k, I don't know. k gets the value of j over i, and then I will increment k by 1, and I will print out the value of k on my screen. These are all operators. The division operator, increment operator, assignment operator, stream insertion operator, etc. And these operators are all defined for integers. Why don't I, why don't I do the same thing with my own classes? Let's say, let's say bank account class. Remember bank account? Okay. B1 is $100.20, B2 is $200, and uh, B3 is just, I did not specify anything, it is zero. So it would be nice to have something like this. B3 is combination of these two. Uh, bank account objects okay so if b1 is hundred dollars and twenty cents and if b2 is two hundred dollars i expect b3 to be three hundred dollars and twenty cents right so this would be nice and this would be even nicer see out b3 so print this out on the screen for me that would be nice that would be nice right Okay, how about this one? Do you think this would be nice? What 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 would what would this do? What do you expect this this one to do? Does it make sense? Maybe maybe it is like maybe this one is like um increment the dollars by one dollar right just increment the dollars by one dollar i mean if i if i can if i if i use my imagination i could do such a thing but how about this how about this b3 gets the value of not b1 what is this So this, this one doesn't make much sense, right? So all I'm saying is that for our new types, it would be very useful to have like addition operator, stream insertion operator, maybe increment operator, but not all operators are suitable for our new types. Okay, so with the operator overloading, we are going to make a decision which operators I like, which operators uh, uh, will be overloaded for my class. And what will be their functions? Okay, what will be my functions? The index operator, index operator makes sense for the vectors, right? Index operator makes sense for the vectors, but index operator doesn't make any sense for this bank account. Okay, so it is up to us to make a decision which operators I would overload and which operators I would not overload. So um, operator overloading means uh, many things, but one of the things is that decision of decision of uh, uh, decision of uh, finding the list of operators that will be overloaded. After that, uh, implementation of the overloading. Okay, as the name implies, operator overloading is very similar to function overloading. Okay, so. The plus operator is already there. The name is there. We are going to overload that plus operator with new types. That's what we did with the function overloading all the time. Okay. So good. So this is just a simple introduction. Let me let me put this aside and let's look at this expression again. Let's look at this expression again. When I say when I say, 
Okay. When I say um, B1 plus B2, compiler, when it sees this expression, compiler thinks that the user is trying to call a operator, okay? But the operators are like functions. So the compiler says that there is a global function named operator plus. It's a global function. Its name is operator plus, and it will take two parameters, b1 and b2, okay? This is one way of thinking. The other one is the, operator, the compiler thinks that this object b1 belongs to a class that has a data member, data as a function member named operator plus, and it will take a second parameter b2. Okay, so the so compiler will interpret this as either this one or that one. It will think that either there is a global function named operator plus that takes two parameters, or there is a member function that belongs to the class of this B1, named operator plus, that will take another object B2, okay? So that's the that's the main mechanism that, uh, that we are gonna use for operator overloading. Uh, and without talking too much about the, uh, the, the, the details of operator overloading, I will just show you just this example, okay? We have a new, we have a new class named money. Money class is very similar to bank account class, okay? And we are going to represent money, US dollars, with the money class. And in fact, only the name is different. It is exactly the same as the bank account. Oh, no, no, no. There is no rate, of course. Okay, there is no rate in this one. Okay. Other than the rate, it is very similar to the bank account class. So these are no parameter constructor, constructor that takes a double integers, dollars and cents. And these are our nice getters, input and output. Our const stuff is here, good, okay. And these are the private functions. Do you remember those private functions? They are the, the functions that I didn't like. Actually, I forgot to tell you this, but I think this makes more sense static. Okay. I don't want, I, this is better. This is better. Static. Yeah, okay. I don't want them to be when I make them static, remember? Okay. This is bothering me a lot, actually. I mean, making these dollars per cents per then round part of this class is bothering me a lot. But the alternative is making it global, and I don't like it either. So I am making it static. Static means that I could use this dollars per cents per cent round without any objects. And in fact, I am telling the compiler that these three don't need the dollars or cents to, to work, okay? So this is a better way of using these functions than the making them regular, non-static, private, constant uh, 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 functions. Okay, so that was a parenthesis, and let's close that parenthesis, and let's go back to operator overloading. So this is our money class, and I like to be able to write, I like to be able to write code like this. Your amount and my amount. Your amount is going to have uh, no parameters, so it is zero dollars and zero cents. My amount is ten dollars and nine cents. Okay, I call my input. I call my output. No problem. But look at this one. The equality operator. If your amount is equal to my amount, so somebody has overloaded this equals operator the logical operator so it takes two parameters your amount and my amount okay and um and it returns uh, true or false a boolean if it is true then the our amounts are the same otherwise it is different one of us is richer 
Similarly, somebody has overloaded this plus operator. It takes two parameters, two money objects, and it returns another money object. And I assign that one to our amount. So somebody has overloaded this index operator. Okay. So uh, what else? Do I see anything else? No, I don't see any, any other. So how many operators are overloaded here? How many operators are overloaded for my money class? Can somebody tell me? By looking at this code between 37 and 63, how many operators do you see overloaded for my money class? Mustafa says it is three, Ishim says four. Yeah, Mehmet says that equality, assignment, and plus. So where, where is the fourth one is coming from? Where is the fourth one? Somebody says five. Oh, is he, okay. I don't, I, I don't know. I, I don't see five. I don't see four. Okay, I see the operator, logical equality operator. I see the plus operator and I see the assignment operator. Other than that, I don't see anything. Oh, okay, there is this minus operator. Okay, that's good. Yeah, okay. That's the fourth one. Four. Okay. There is the fourth one. It looks like there are four of them. So, what did I say? Let's look at this one. When the compiler sees this one, it will think that there is an global function named operator and your amount comma my amount okay so the compiler is going to call this global function with these two parameters when it sees this one okay and when it sees this one the compiler will call operator operator plus and parentheses again your amount comma my amount okay very similar to oh okay how about this assignment then let's let's write this one as separate okay so then it's going to be operator assignment okay it's going to be our amount comma and okay this is operator okay so this is the this is the real thing okay so there is one plus operator there is one assignment operator two operators are called one after the other the first plus operator is called because it has the uh, higher pri privilege and uh, the next one is the assignment operator Okay, so why do I keep saying this? I keep saying this because this is what we are going to overload. This one, this function. Okay, let's 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 look at this one. Okay, so for the plus operator, there is a function named global function named. Let's forget about this global function uh, member function thing for the object oriented world. For the sake of uh, explainability, let's start with the uh, global functions. There is this operator plus. Okay, it could be either like this one or okay. I, I prefer them. I prefer them no spaces. Okay, so there is this operator plus. It will take two money objects, one money object and the second money object. It will not modify any of them. It will add them together and it will return a money object, another money object, but it's a constant money object. Operator minus is very similar to operator plus. It will take two of them. And operator uh, uh, equality will take two objects, compare them, and it will return a boolean. Oh, this is interesting. What is line 34? What is, what is this? Line 34. It looks like 
it is operator minus again it's a global function but this one doesn't take two parameters it just takes a single parameter is there a syntax error somebody made a mistake no it, they, they didn't make a mistake this is right so can somebody tell me the difference between line 30 and 34 Atakan said it is negative amount. Uh, Mehmet Hüseyin said it is decreasing. No, this is not decrement operator. Um, uh, Yunus, you, uh, Mehmet Hüseyin, this is not minus minus. Okay, this is just single minus. You know what this is? This is for, let's say, let's say, my money, money one, okay, gets the value of negative money two, something like that. Okay. This one is line 34 and this one is for line 30. Okay. So this is a binary minus operator, line 30. This one is a unary. Okay. Unary. Unary operator. This one is binary. Where did it go? <laughs> okay, here it is. Okay, this is binary. Line 30 is binary. Let me make this okay. Line 34 is unary. Okay, so so uh, so this is these are if if you implement these four functions, I'm not calling them operators, right? These are the functions. If you implement these four functions, then um then you will be done with operator overloading why because when the compiler sees this one line 49 it will call this function with two parameters when the compiler sees this line line 54 it will make these two function calls operator plus then the operator assignment by the way i don't see any operator assignments here one two three four there are no operator assignments Okay, there are no operator assignments. That's because operator assignment, by default, there is one for all the classes that you can have, okay? If you have a class, the operator assignment is automatically defined for you. Okay, it's like a, remember the default constructor? If you have a class, there is a default constructor. If you have a class, there is a default assignment operator already defined. Okay, let's look at the operator implementations. Let, let's start from the simplest one. Operator equal to line 32. Yeah, okay, here it is. This one. It will take, make it larger. It will take two money objects as reference, constant references. And it will say, if your dollars if the, the, the dollars of amount one is the same as dollars of amount uh, two, and if the cents of amount one is same as cents of amount two, they are equal. Otherwise, they are not equal. So this this one is nicely using, this one is nicely using um, the public member functions. We have to use the public member functions because these are global functions. These are not part of the class. These are not part of the class. So I implemented equal to or the equality operator for this class. I have already implemented it. Okay. So let's look at the other implementations, the plus operator. The plus operator again will take two money objects at constant references. It says that let's calculate the cents. I mean, let's forget about the dollars. And let's convert them everything. Let's convert everything to cents. If I have ten dollars and twenty cents, so ten times hundred is thousand and twenty. So it's going to be thousand and twenty cents. One thousand twenty cents. Okay. So I converted amount one to cents. I converted amount two to cents, and I added the cents now, and then i summed all the cents uh, i need to be careful about the uh, absolute value because uh, one of the amounts could be a negative 
and I do this conversion to dollars and cents, right? And then uh, if the cents are less than zero, then I convert them to minus so that I, uh, uh, I, I, I do it proper negative positive thing. And I return this one. I think we did not see anything like this before. It returns an anonymous object and I am as, as promised. I, we could have done it this way. I like this. I like it this way better. A money object, temporary money object. Okay. And it is final dollars and final cents. And return my temporary object. It is doing exactly the same thing. Okay, so I am returning a temporary object. I made a temporary object and I am returning a temporary object. As I promised, I did not modify amount one. I did not modify amount two. Okay, because I use their const member functions. I didn't call their set rate, set uh, set dollar set again, uh, dollar set cents, or I did not use uh, amount one dot uh, input. I did not modify them. I cannot because it is a constant. And I made a new object. I returned that object. Okay, this is the plus operator. Very nice, right. and small function, and we use this function. For operator overloading remember what I said before I said when the compiler sees it it either thinks it's a global function or a member function so in this case since I have implemented the global function I don't need this member function they cannot happen both at the same time either this one or that one by the way yeah let's let's look at this one when the compiler sees minus b2 it will do either what it will do either operator minus then b2 or b2 dot operator minus then what is my parameter no parameters okay so this operator will not take any parameters so if I have implemented it as a global function it's going to take a single parameter as a member function it's going it's not going to take a parameter okay so this is what I did uh, for the plus operator let's look at the minus operator minus operator is copy pasted everything is the same as plus operator right Everything is exactly the same. I don't like this kind of code. I don't like this kind of code. Look at this. It is exactly the same. The only difference is here. This plus becomes a minus. I don't like this code because it is copy pasted. Okay, we don't like copy pasting. So what is our solution? Let's let's look at this other let's look at this other unit operator minus it takes a money okay global function it takes a money and it says that i am going to return a new money object that has the negative dollars and negative cents of the original original uh, original uh, parameter amount okay so this one is nice, no uh, copying, pasting. It's a new original function. So it works, it works. So why I skipped from this function, that one, I am saying that instead of doing this, instead of doing this, let me comment this out. Okay, I am commenting this out. And I will do this. Return. Somebody type what I, what I like to type here. I will implement this in a single line. I will return. I will. I will. I will implement this in a single line. Q 
Just I am trying to give you a hint. Okay, here's my hint. Okay, I got it. Exactly, exactly what Atakan says. Amount one, okay, plus minus amount two. And when you see this, you're gonna say, "What? What is this? What? What are we? Gonna, what are we? What are we doing here?" It's just so this unary minus. Remember, unary minus has a higher privilege, higher presence than the. Uh, binary minus or plus so this one will be called first okay after this one gets the negative uh, amount I add it to the amount one so the compiler will think this as okay operator plus it will take two parameters one of them is amount one okay the second one is another operator minus and it will take amount 2 did I do it right okay one two yeah okay so this is what compiler will think in this case so it is I called two operators so I avoided copying and pasting I am reusing what I did before good okay maybe that the book did not do this just to show us how the things work uh, maybe they didn't see it but this is the better way of doing things maybe yeah, it is difficult to understand this at the beginning when you start doing stuff okay so I think we looked at operator plus operator minus and um, Uh, operator equality and operator unary minus okay so the rest of the stuff is the same our constructors and uh, there is this checking thing get amount thing I don't see any okay I don't see any new stuff okay the only thing is that I, I made them static okay good any questions about operator overloading actually I I, I told you everything about operator loading uh, of course this is not enough that there are many details that we need to talk about there are many details of it but the basic idea is this the basic idea if you like this plus operator to work your on your objects okay you need to overload either this global operator plus or this member function operator plus one of them okay in object oriented world of course we like this one better but uh, as the first example we did this first we did this first okay and in fact let me show you the let me show you the second okay our main function is exactly the same where is my okay equality operator plus operator minus operator and it looks like I did not use the unary minus operator but it is easy to use them if I like to implement these operators overloadings using the member functions instead of global functions this is what I would do see there are four new member functions one of them is plus minus and another minus okay as you see this one takes a single parameter that doesn't mean that it's a unary plus it's a binary plus but the the first parameter is the object itself the second parameter is the parameter passed by the the, the right side of the plus operator the same for the minus the same for the equality and this one is for the and this one is for the 
the the the unary minus unary minus does not take any parameters. As you see, these say that okay, how many counts are there? Okay, for this one, say that I promise, I promise, I will not. Okay, I promise I will not modify the object that I am taking. This one says that. This one says that I promise I will not modify this object. How about this one? This one says that whatever I return, you cannot change it. The, I, we never did this before. Okay. Whatever I return, you cannot change it. Okay. So as you see, there are no global functions in this case. We like this one better. And let's look at the implementations. As I said before, this main did not change at all. Let me show you the main, 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 main. Here it is, the main. So there is no difference between these two. I am trying to align them together so that they are exactly the, what, what's going on. Okay. Did I, should I, okay, good. Main and main they are exactly the same but i think did i change something okay because i have written this here okay and erase this line so these two mains are exactly the same the the only difference is the uh, uh, the comments that i put in so let's look at the code for the second one that one that one that uh, the one that uses the member functions operator plus minus equal to an uh, unary minus the plus operator as you see it takes a second operator as you see the to calculate the sense it uses see this one since these are the member functions of the class they have direct access to the private data members they have direct access to the private data members so it says that get me the private data member cents and private data member dollars and multiply it with 100 and assign it to all cents one and the second one again since i am part of this class okay i have access to the private data members of the second operator you might think that well it's a different object but it might be a different object but it is the same class okay this public privateness thing is for the classes not for the objects okay if i am a private data member or private function okay all the members of the class can have access to the privates that's what i'm doing i get the cents and dollars i do these calculations and I return a new money object. For the minus, I am doing similar stuff. And for the equality operator, I compare dollars and cents and etc. Okay. Of course, I prefer doing this better. Get dollars. Okay. This is better. And second operator get dollars. This is the object oriented way of doing stuff. And this is get cents. And this is get cents. Okay. This is a much better implementation than the previous one, but I think the book is trying to show you something. It shows that with this kind of member functions, you have access to all the private data. Okay, so uh, this is this is how we implement our operators using member functions. This, as the customer, as the customer, I don't see the difference. My mains are exactly the same. The, the main of the global function implementation and the main of the data member function implementation are the same code 
but uh, the way we implement them is different for the operators. Okay, any questions so far about the operator overloading? Using the same mechanism, you may overload any operator available that you like. There are a few exceptions and we are going to look at the exceptions. Some of the operators may not be, cannot be overloaded. And some of the operators, over, although they can be overloaded, we prefer not overloading them because they are confusing. Usually the overloaded operators are kind of standard, plus, minus, and most of the time stream insertion and extraction operators. They will be overloaded. Yunus Emre has a question. How can program access to second operators dollars and cents directly? Aren't them private? That's what I was talking about, Yunus Emre. Uh, the second operand is another object, but it is still in my class, okay? Publicness and privateness, they are for the classes, they are not for the objects. The rule is, the rule is, private data members are accessible to the same classes functions, okay? So, since I am the same class, I could do that. So why do we, why are we hiding our privates? We are hiding our private data members or functions because of the information hiding principle, right? Why do we have the information hiding principle? It says that other classes, other functions, they should not care about my details. But I mean, this is my classes plus operator, okay? This plus operator has a right to access the private data members of all the objects of this class. I am within the same class. There is nothing to hide if I am inside the same class. Okay. So the plus operator is free to access the private data members of all the objects of money class. So that's a good point. And I thought that I stressed that out, but you are asking the same question. That's good. Okay, good. Okay, good. Any other questions? Okay, let's go back to books, slides. Let's go over them one by one. And uh, this will be kind of repeat and this will be a good opportunity for you to ask more questions maybe. Okay. So, in this chapter we are going to do basic operator overloading. And uh, we already did this actually, uni operators and the binary operators. Um, and then later we are going to do this friends function and automatic type conversion. These are the details that I talk about. And then finally, there are some detailed operator overloading stuff, like the overloading of the uh, stream insertion and extraction operators. Okay. And overloading of the assignment operator, index operator, increment and decrement operators. Okay. So we are going to look at them later at the end of the chapter okay operator overloading operators are just really like functions most of them they are just function calls okay when you say when you say um, x plus seven the compiler thinks it as operator plus x comma seven or x dot operator plus seven this is literally what's happening okay so if you like to overload this operator then you implement one of these uh, 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 operators functions as a global or as a data function member in your code, and you are done with operator overloading. That's that's the whole idea. Okay, uh, you could overload only built-in operators. You cannot make up new operators in C plus plus. Okay, only the o o o already defined available operators could be overloaded only only the available ones are overloaded that's why the name is overloading it is not definition of operator okay why because plus has a meaning already for integers for strings it has a meaning for pointers okay plus so you are adding a new meaning to plus plus is overloaded many 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 times hundreds of times maybe if you consider the STL library too. So you are adding a new meaning to plus. 
Again, the similar for equality or assignment or the multiplication. Okay, so if there is an operator available, you may overload them most of the time. Okay. Uh, the other thing is that since, I mean, this is my, this is my function, right? Operator minus is my function. If it's a my function, then I could do anything I like. I can do this. C out. Hello world. Okay. And return return money zero comma zero. Would would compiler say anything to me? Like this doesn't make any sense. What are you doing? It's a unit minus operator and you are just printing a hello world on the screen and you are returning 0, 0.0. No, the compiler will not say anything because compiler say that it's a function and it is doing something and it's returning a money object and I will compile it and it will run when I call the minus operator. Does it make any sense? No, it doesn't make absolutely no sense. Okay, so it is up to you to overload your operators in a sensible way, in a sensible way. Don't do this. This is stupid. Okay. Don't do this. This is stupid. Do it right. This is the right way of overloading your unary minus operator. That's what the book says. Always overload with similar actions. If it's a minus operator, it should have something to do with the negativity or the subtraction. Okay. If it's a if it's a, a plus operator, it, should, it has to do something addition of one thing to another thing. Okay, so it should make sense when you overload them. Otherwise, uh, with the operator overloading, you're not doing any good for yourself or for anybody else. Okay, uh, again, operator overloading, as the name implies, is very similar to overloading of functions. Okay, the operator itself is a name of the function. So operator plus is the name of the plus uh, operator. It will take two parameters and it will return another one, a money object. Okay. There we shall know. I as I said I said that before. You cannot create your own operators. This is not operator creation. It is called operator overloading. What is the meaning of overloading? The name is already there. Okay. You are giving a new meaning to an already existing operator. No, the answer is definitely uh, capital letters. No, you cannot make up new operators. The only the, the only operators are available uh, operators available in that are available in C. So what are those? This one is available. This one is not available, right? You cannot do that. Okay. Uh, what else this one yeah this one is available this is uh, exclusive or plus operator modular operator uh, additive operator is available of course division parenthesis is not an operator anyway I'm trying to see what kind of things the index op operators where are the index operators I forgot here are index operators okay index operators are there so any operator that is available for C or C++, you can overload. Otherwise, you cannot. So you cannot make a new operator out of this single quote thing, okay? Or double quote thing. That's one of the rules of operator overloading. Oh, okay. It, it looks like I'm out of my time. Uh, that's it for today then. But I, I will stop here, but if you have any questions, I can I can be here for a few more minutes. I could answer your questions and how way should we use enum types in homework number two? I think I explained it in homework number two. Uh, each cell it could be either empty cell or computer cell or the user cell, right? So this said enumeration of three values. User one, user two, or empty, right? Cells, or user one, 
computer or empty just use enumeration c plus plus 11 enumeration for that that's what i said in homework number two you could ask the load game in any time while the game is running it could be at the beginning it could be in the middle Barish, if your design requires to use more than three, then you could, yes. Okay, are there any other questions? If there are no questions, then I will... We load the game we said before. Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean the, the format of your saved game depends on you. We cannot know that. So to load a game, it is a better idea to save it first and load it later while your game is running. Yeah, sure. I mean, your, your the the format, format of your game saved file is your decision. No, no, no. Well, I mean, when you save it, you are giving already a file name. Okay. You save the current configuration to your file and you load it. You load the current configuration. There are no multi saves. I mean, of course, you could save it multiple times to different files, but you don't save it to the same file multiple times. If you, if you do it that way, the last one that you saved will be there. If it didn't save any game, well, Cheval, I mean, when you are saving your games, you are giving it a file name, right? When you load a game, you need to give a file name too. If there are no file names available, then load will not work. Load, command load needs a file name. Okay, good. Okay, then I will see you on Monday.